like my eyes like bugged out of my head. <laughs> and for that example, he basically said, look, guys, we all agree that like the foundation of the U.S. was based upon the like plunder of the indigenous people that are here, but that doesn't impact policy today. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, 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 like what? We literally have a Bureau of Indian Affairs, bruh. Welcome back to Left Anchor. I'm Alexi the Greek. And I'm Ryan Cooper. Uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome to the podcast Jamal Green, otherwise known as Surly Urbanist on Twitter, um, who is a uh, public policy, um, urban planning expert, um, and working on a still work, a grad student. Is that correct, Jamal? So uh, I just graduated. Uh, so oh. I'm officially like Dr. Surly. Mm. Um, ah, love it. Shit. Love it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> I, and I'm now working for the state of Oregon as a research analyst um, uh, concerning questions of uh, child welfare policy. Cool. Yeah. Important yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like it's 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 a little bit heavier than uh, you know than, than some of the things I touch on in my dissertation. <laughs> yeah. Um, Feel free to tell us a, a bit more about your background as well before we dive in, if if uh, if you'd like. What was your dissertation on? Um, my dissertation was on the ever exciting topic of industrial zoning. Um, ah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, you know, in trying to. Um, and try, you know, like the kind of like greater theoretical question was really trying to tease out um, questions between like land use policy and labor market outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. And I was looking at it through the question of industrial zoning, and in particular, a like relatively new set of land use policies that are designed to like explicitly protect scarce industrial lands for the purpose of economic development. Uh, trying to be able to maintain industries and manufacturing, uh, you know, like, 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 you know, like in cities, and in turn, you know, provide those good jobs that, that are there. Um, I, I won't yeah. go any deeper because, again, like it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but you know, I thought it was cool. Well, I think that that yeah, no, I mean, it, that's one of those subjects. I think not knowing that much about it myself, but I, I. Uh, I think it sounds a lot more boring than it is. Um, it's one of those things where it's like, yo, oh, why does the city look like this? Why did, why are these uh, factories here or not here that turn out to be like super relevant for, you know, how, how, uh, how people live in their day to day lives. But it, it also ties into the, you know, the, the question we, the reason we wanted to have you on, which is the uh, ongoing debate over slavery and capitalism. Um, which is very much an economic development story and the main sort of axis of discussion. Um, in the, the recent uh, 1619 project at the New York Times, um, folks had a, a, uh, a number of articles which argued to in, in varying ways that slavery was like sort of essential or very important. You know, those are two different claims, but you know, we can, we can dig into that, um, about, you know, whether, whether, um, uh, that impact that slavery had on the early industrial development of the United States. And I think it's an interesting debate, you know, cause it really gets into, um, you know, the different sort of ideological valences of, um, you know, the like broader, like meta, uh, um, ideological or moral claims that people are trying to make and defend. Um, and so uh, maybe to start off with uh, is the question of, was it necessary for the development of, you know, the, the early development of the United States as, a, as an industrial power, right? And like, what's your take on that question? Well, so my take on that probably follows more closely to the economic historians, right? Which is that, like, because that question really gets at, I think, a more narrow technical question that really should probably be, that should probably be looking at, you know, like the flows of like goods and services and capital and labor, right? And yeah. to that extent, Northern industrialization 
um, you know, like while Northern finance definitely, you know, was able to like pull wealth from the South that, that, um, um, that was embodied in slaves, um, Northern industrialization was relatively hived off from the South, right? And Northern industrialization was really able to expand um, kind of in spite of the South's dominance, right? So like um, N- Northern textile manufacturers weren't necessarily using only like cotton that was produced from the South. And there were many other goods that the North was able to go on and produce without necessarily like needing uh, products or goods from the South, right? So I think to a certain extent, you know, one can make the argument uh, that slavery was not super necessary for the greater industrialization process as seen in the North, right? Um, And I think probably the most like dramatic example of that is actually the Civil War itself, where where the South itself, you know, lost because of its lack of greater mass industry in the North was kind of able to just kind of like pick up and keep going and produce and produce at like a much higher rate. Right. Um, Yeah. You know, I mean, like, so if the North had been much more dependent upon the South for its ability to be able to produce, you know, then the civil war probably would have like gone even worse. Um, So, you know, like, Um, So, you know, like, so I think on that kind of like more narrow technical question, I think one can say slavery was like maybe not absolutely vital. And certainly for the South, the insistence on maintaining slavery absolutely um, limited its ability uh, to further industrialize and grow. Yeah, yeah. And what about the broader, uh, like, international situation, right? Because, you know, the UK, right, was, you know, up through the mid-19th century, the industrial power. And they, if I'm not mistaken, got most of their cotton from the southern United States. And so, um, you know, in a sense, they were kind of... I'm not sure. I haven't seen statistics on what uh, balance the balance of uh, where the cotton went. Uh, I, I want to say that a majority of it went to the UK. It was exported. I'm not certain about that, but certainly a great proportion of it did, and it was a very profitable trade because that was you know early industrial revolution was uh, you know textiles and and so that supply was pretty critical, but. It you know, I don't know. First, on on that larger question, it seems to me that you know there's also you could you could look at it. It was um, part of how it did develop successfully, but probably not absolutely necessary. Is that is that a fair take? Do you think? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that that is a fair take, and that's generally where, at least from what I've seen on Twitter the past couple of weeks, there's been this kind of like, I mean, you know, like things are always like super overwrought on Twitter, but this seems like even (laughs) more overwrought than normal um, with folks kind of like sniping at each other um, on the economic historian side and like the new history of capitalism side. And you have this kind of like smaller academic debate with like actual historians and economic historians and sociologists who are like sniping at each other. And then you have this kind of like, larger cultural debate, which has kind of like seeded this new thing that started with the 1619 project. And then these really kind of like, you know, conservative responses to it. Um, And the conservative responses, you know, they're using the arguments of the economic historians to, you know, like um, um, to basically say that like all the claims of the 1619 project are like fraudulent. Right. Right. Um, can you dig into that a little bit? Like, what, what, are, who's saying that? What are they saying exactly? Yeah, I mean, so was it was like, was it like, is it the Carl Waters cat? I can't remember his name. Um, because I got it because I saw Matt Iglesias had retweeted this Bloomberg column. I think it was Carl Waters. I, I can't remember. Um, and he was focusing on Matthew Desmond's article in the 1619 Project, which is really talking about this kind of like slavery, capitalism, um, 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 link. 
and Carl Waters, he's taking the economic historians to say uh, the people that uh, the um, the the people that the people that Desmond cites uh, get some of their basic empirics wrong, and that is like a huge thing that actually does matter, um, um, and that they overstate the influence of slavery on the industrialization of the U.S. And because slavery was actually a small part of the overall industrialization of the U.S., uh, slavery really doesn't have any like shaping of our contemporary economy or on the economic system that seeded its growth, right? Um, mm. So they are using this as a way to like back into a moral argument for capitalism or to say that capitalism itself is a more moral system, uh, you know, um, a system that encourages slavery and all this other kind of stuff. Um, you know, like, um, and I've seen this quote a couple of times now of this like famous um, slavery apologist who is basically like, hey, man, I don't read Adam Smith and I don't read Ricardo and these other like classical economists because they talk about how labor should be free. Right. And then you have these conservatives who are like, look, if Adam Smith, the like godfather of like how we understand capitalism was not liked by slavery, then clearly capitalism is this like morally strong, like anti-slavery force. And like, that's just not the case. <laughs> yeah, right? that, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the key. So I think that's the key meta battle, like the, the, the battle over why are we talking about this? Why is this culturally relevant? What's the work being done by using, say, the economic historians uh, or the economic development uh, development? Uh, talk in a certain political way now, but I don't think it's just the conservatives unless, I mean, we can call Iglesias a conservative, but I think like the neoliberals are also defending capitalism in a way when like Iglesias, they want to make sure to point out that, you know, this wasn't the most efficient uh, way that capitalism could have developed as right. if capitalism just maximizes in the most efficient way, right? Instead of having these ideological components that are in inextricable from it. Right, 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 right. No, no, no. I, I think that that is spot on, right? Like, um, and Matt has taken to the kind of like snarky thing of saying like, well, you know, I think it's funny that it's now a right wing argument to say that slavery was like bad for economic development. And that's just, you know, like a total mischaracterization of the, li um, a, uh, a total mischaracterization of the, li of the literature. Uh, but it also carries the water for these conservatives, right? You know, who actually want to use this as a way to deny uh, the the you know you know to deny the real political, economic, and cultural impacts of slavery, including durable anti-black racism and systemic racism that like carries through to today, right? Yeah. Um, and that's where the like new historians of capitalism, or even more like left social scientists like, like myself start to separate ourselves um, from some of the economic historians, right? So now look, most of the economic historians that I've seen on Twitter, like they're actually making like rather narrow technical claims on certain kinds of estimates, which I entirely respect, right? A point that I've been trying to make a kind of more like, like broader or, or meta point also is that these two groups of folks are kind of talking past each other, right? Because they have like very yeah. different missions and very different, um, they, they have very different epistemological like moorings and goals, right? Um, now where the two groups kind of overlap is saying, look, is like slavery, um, slavery inhibited uh, greater industrial development, most certainly in the South, but also probably for the country as a whole, right? And we can like see this going today where many parts of the yep. South that um, where many parts of the South that were most heavily dependent on slavery are still much poor. Uh, they are less well educated. They are more sick and all these other kind of things, right? Um, and there's like multiple studies in different fields. And, you know, like, and they use like different quantitative methods and qualitative methods, but it just shows it's like, hey, like all this racism down here where you got all these people who like, you know, who, uh, you know, you know, who basically work against any kind of strengthening of the public sector or usage of the public to do some kind of like greater social good is summarily rejected on the off chance that some black folks may benefit from it. Right. And in turn, this harms everyone. 
right? Yeah. And, um, and that goes directly to slavery, right? And and like I don't think it's being like a woolly headed leftist to to be like, hey guys, uh, this system that was based upon like black people being chattel, and you had like an entire set of like culture and science and politics and economics like literally built upon insisting upon like the physical moral and cultural and intellectual inferiority of black people right like that all of that which still somehow still like pops up in random ways it seems uh and seems to have like a really like a durable effect not only on like small regional politics but in national politics right like that is the long tail that is the long descendant of slavery. So I don't think it's an overstatement to say that no, like slavery still has a very profound effect on our economy if you think about the economy as simply greater than trying to parse out different contributors to GDP, right? Yeah. Like um, if you think about the economy, you know, as a set of institutions and practices and beliefs, And then in turn, if you think about how those things shape our markets, then yeah, if this is a super racist country and that racism is like born from this peculiar institution, then yeah, no, it still has a rather like interesting hand in terms of what's going on today. Now, you know, now, you know, like, can we necessarily like parse that out in a finely tuned manner? Maybe not. Right. And that's where the economists and the economic historians may separate from, right? But that doesn't mean that people who are doing the kind of like historical work and the political theory work or the cultural theory work are necessarily in the wrong, right? And this is where the conservatives are coming in because, you know, they have a very specific mission, which is basically to say, hey, like this whole like systemic racism thing is overstated, right? And if you're going to say this like systemic racism thing is overstated, then you have to be able to go back and be like, well, okay, um, yeah, slavery was like not good, but also it wasn't that important, right? And you're like, and I just don't know how, if you are like a reasonable observer of social events, how one can say that. Like, it it just kind of like boggles the mind to me that yeah. that happens to be the case, right? Um, so, um, so you have these kind of like grand cultural products and the 1619 project is this like grand cultural product, right? I mean, like I, you know, um, I think that it may have a like rather long life, I hope in some rather fruitful ways. Right. And then you have this, you know, like response on the other side. And then you have this kind of like bubbling academic thing that goes underneath. That's actually like, you know, more narrow, also more petty because, you know, like that's what we do in academia, um, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, like, um, and, um, but on Twitter, at least, you know, it's like mixed in because there's like a whole lot more of this kind of like, uh, like um, flat relationship between these actors, right? Um, and that's why I don't want to ascribe particular ideological leanings to economic historians as like a group of people, because like that is not accurate and it's not fair. But I would say that for certain folks in the economic historian camp who are really trying to sit about these claims are really about like much more narrow claims about like the like specific bits of GDP that like cotton was for, um, for the economy as a kind of like big joker to try and negate what um, what these other folks are saying entirely misses the point. That's right. And, and, and therefore, there, there's nothing neutral about it because insofar as every inquiry ha- does political work, and, and of course it's less particularly salient to any given individual what they do their dissertation on, but when the academic work is being appropriated in political discussions, uh, there, there's no such thing as just like a cutoff neutral inquiry. It's like, well, why right. is this the focus? Why is this the emphasis? What work is being done by, by this particular inquiry? And right. when you have people who are, it seems to me, I mean, for me, the main thing is there are people who are trying to use empirics or data to support capitalism as being liberatory in nature, yes. right? 
and, yes. and, and, and using history to support that and saying, look, these evils, uh, these, these exploitations and oppressions are either an aberration or not capitalism functioning properly. Or some people are arguing that was like pre-capitalistic. And so, right. so the, that, that's, I think, for me, uh, so important to talk about because it argues for a certain way forward politically and economically. Oh, yes. No, I, I entirely agree. And I think that's a great way of using it, right? Um, where it's like, even if you try to have a mask of neutrality for your work, as soon as it's written up in the New York Times or the National Review, right, it's no right. longer a neutral work. <laughs> that's right. Right? right. I mean, you know, yeah. um, and I mean, like, um, so trying to argue that you're like being misread or that the work is neutral. Well, okay. Trying to argue that your work is neutral then becomes like a fool's errand. I do think that you can respond forcefully and say, I am being misread or misunderstood, right? Yeah. But, um, of course. But you can't ever like pull your work back to neutrality, uh, assuming that it was ever even quote unquote neutral in the first place. So, how should we then appropriate the lessons from these different? forms, this different disciplines, these different ways of looking at the relationship between slavery and capitalism. So yeah. politically, how should we think about what's emancipatory, what's oppressive? Because, you know, I, we can see parallels to wage slavery. We can see parallels to uh, indictments of capitalism today uh, and the legacy of slavery on economic or, or wealth inequality today. So, like, what things should we, in, in light of you know, this great project the New York Times is doing in light of the, the new discussion of the need for reparations. How, how should we think politically about using these great resources uh, politically today? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, honestly, for me, like, part of it is just reinforcing the idea and evidence for, like, kind of hard, persistent systemic racism and how that systemic racism has, you know, in a very, like, you know, like, long and deliberate fashion, built different forms of prosperity upon the plunder of racialized populations, mm. right? Mm. Um, when you have someone who's like, oh, well, you know, like, my grandparents came here in, like, the early 1900s. I don't understand, like, why this slavery thing is here. It's like, well, you know, there was this thing, like, after the Civil War called Jim Crow that didn't stop until, like, 1968. So, you know, like... Your grandparents, if they were like coded as white, still benefited from like hard segregation. You know uh, that um, they still had access to certain like resources and benefits and all these other kind of things that were explicitly uh, refused to black folks, or in some cases was like taken away from <laughs> black people and yeah. given to you, right? Yeah. Uh, so no one is innocent from the plunder, right? That's right. Um, and that is, some, you know, um, and that's something that I think, like, especially in the social sciences, you know, like, it's something where I think if you're someone who has, uh, you know, who follows that kind of a theoretical line of thought, like, this is something that I'm constantly trying to impart upon my students. And, you know, like, most of my students are, um, they are, they are generally receptive, you know, but sometimes I get some like hard pushback from folks and it's like really trying to like carve out and give a like careful tale to show like, like, look, man, like this is how this is like going. Right. And we can discuss the, the like different responses on how that is. Right. But it's absolutely not the case that like your grandparents who came from, you know, like Eastern Europe and like the early 1900s, like, you know, they didn't just succeed only because they like worked harder than black people because like black people don't have a culture that rewards work. Right. Like that's explicitly <laughs> like racist arguments. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Right. Um, um, and, um, and, and people yeah. forget that, that Ta-Nehisi Coates's case for reparations is largely about redlining. Right. And yes. largely, so it's like, uh, I know my students, when I teach this to them, are, are blown away because sometimes the, the reactionary responses to calls for whether it's affirmative action or reparations um, want to focus just on poverty without respect, you know, quote unquote, race neutral, if you will. And right. when, when this piece points out that, OK, well, we can take 
a black family that makes $100,000 a year and a white family that makes $100,000 a year, and they're living in totally different neighborhoods. In fact, the black family is living in the neighborhood that's equivalent to the white family making $30,000. Right. Now, now, can you see how this involves race, right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, exactly. Right. Like, um, and, and it's on that question where I'm even on more, like, sure footing than on the kind of, like, grand history of capitalism stuff because, you know, like, I am a planner. Right. And it's just mm-hmm. trying to sit there and be like, look, man, like, you know, you can go to like um, the like um, deed, um, um, the contract rent stuff to redlining to just like straight like appropriation of black property. Right. Um, you know, it it's just just it, it I mean, like the, the plunder of black people's communities persists far after slavery and even persists after the fall of Jim Crow, right? Like yep. the, um, today, right? This, this is a major na- part of the, the, uh, mortgage crisis after 2008. It was, uh, but black people had subprime mortgages. A lot of times like middle-class black folks who would have qualified for regular mortgages got stuffed in the subprime because that's what finance wanted. Yep. Um, and so, you know, they, they got hit worst by the, by the, uh, um, financial, the, the, the foreclosure crisis. And, uh, yeah, one, one calculation that I made with, uh, with Matt Brunick was that the, the fraction of black homeowners who are underwater on their mortgages went up by 20 fold from 2007 to 2013. Um, and which is just a vast confiscation of, of wealth. From the black middle class. Ryan, you, you in fact wrote about how under Obama, there was a massive failure to help those black families when there was funding and like a, a, a yeah. huge de- devoted trust of money specifically that could have been helping those families. Yep. Yeah. Look, I mean, like, so basically all and, and it would be basically say basically all and I mean all of the gains in wealth that black folks made like basically like post 1964, 1968 was wiped out all of it. Yeah. Right. And it's not like black folks had a whole lot of wealth to (laughs) begin with. Right. Uh, But basically like all of that was wiped out. Right. And folks are just starting to like try and dig themselves out of the hole. And I saw an article the other day, I believe it was in the wall street journal. I only saw the headline, but basically the headline was like, um, household wealth in the country is finally starting to like get back towards like is finally starting to get back towards like 2007 2009 levels even though it's still less than 2003 and i was sitting there and i was like you know what i want to see those calculations taken out by race because i would be very very surprised if black americans have even seen our little bit of wealth go back to even those pre-recession days like it was that it was that and, bad. And this, uh, this, this, I think, raises another que- um, question about the whole capitalism uh, and slavery argument, which is that, that one of these lines of, of argument you see sometimes more tacitly, sometimes more explicitly on the you know, conservative kind of libertarian right, and also among neoliberals, is that you know, capitalism is, it can be some sort of like dissolving force against racism that, you know, like if you if your society is racist, then that means that you're not doing capitalism enough. And like I was reading a, an, an old, um, bit from, uh, Milton Friedman's book that someone had posted some excerpts, uh, capitalism freedom, I think from the mid sixties, which is when he was arguing against the Civil Rights Act. And he was doing this sort of classic supposition that, um, you know, well, if if you're just in a market, the market should, if you just, you're in the frictionless planes mind space of economists, uh, you should be able to make more money if you are not racist uh, because you will be able to capitalize on these returns by getting better employees for cheaper and all that kind of shit. And, you know, one thing he didn't mention in that article was that, you know, if you had an integrated business and the uh, KKK comes and burns down your 
your uh, place of establishment, then that's uh, kind of bad for profits too. But I think more convincingly, going back into the, 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 the slavery situation is that even if we stipulate the argument that uh, the, that slavery inhibited the industrial development of America and especially the South up to the present day. Uh, it is not the case that slavery, or sorry, capitalism it, uh, uh, presented any sort of obstacle to slavery or like any of that dissolving force, as far as I can tell. On the contrary, it enabled it at every turn. And in fact, it seems to me maybe made it worse because it made it more profitable, and it made it more profitable. Um, and this is one of the parts of uh, Edward Baptist's books, book uh, from a couple of years ago that I find most convincing, is that uh, it provided a big incentive for slave owners to extract more uh, uh, labor out of their slaves, right? And so made, you know, turned what had been um, maybe somewhat more traditional type of slavery, like Roman slavery, where it wasn't like super organized and disciplined into this really nightmarish system where it was just all about profit. And if you could make a nickel to ripping families apart and sending them to every corner of the country, you would do it. And if you could make a nickel by just like beating the absolute shit out of your slaves day after day, you would do it. Um, and that, I don't know, like... I've heard some criticisms of Baptist's book, but that part I think seems to be pretty solid. I don't know what's your what's your take on that? Uh, well, so it's interesting because like that's actually one of the claims that actually gets like really heavily attacked, right? Um, in, yeah. Um, and I tend to actually fall, I think, again more on the economic historian side, who posit that like, look, like not everyone used gang labor in that way, and they were still productive, right? So that's like one thing and that's not to say that slavery like wasn't brutal because it was right? right yeah um but there is also strong evidence that that kind of like growth in productivity was due to new kinds of seed hybrids that made cotton like more pickable and more abundant yeah. right so you have this kind of like technological advancement argument um that helps to improve productivity along with like really harsh kind of like new labor regimes and things like that right so again people did use like gang labor work people did beat the shit out of enslaved folks families were broken up the sexual abuse of enslaved folks was rampant and across on many different things um whether slavery was successful basically because of the cruelty I do think that that is a more narrow empirical question that I do think the economic historians have made some like strong responses to saying like, yeah, it was there, but that wasn't why it had grown so great. So right. on that end, that's where I would like separate myself from Baptist, um, you know, but his overall thing about being like, hey, man, this is like a really horrific goddamn thing. And basically like all of the incentives were towards like, how do I eke like every like last little thing? out of these people who have literally no rights um, and you can do whatever the hell you want. Right. I mean, like, it's just like, it's, 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 it's a beyond like mind boggling way of even trying yeah. to like, conceive of a way of life. And, and um, I guess for, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please, please go on. Oh, I was just going to say, I, so, so maybe the opposite point is easier to, to, to make, which is that uh, capitalism has nothing inherent in it that is emancipatory so so it, even if it's not necessary to maximize cruelty right. but neither does it further capitalism per se to do everything that's better for the workers or the slaves oh, yeah, of course. right like it's a, of course. and so like in the in the sense that like when we've talked on this podcast before about say like labor aristocracy and we've shown through the data ryan did some, some good work to show that like there's nothing necessary to the progress in our GDP to exploit people around the world. Uh, and in fact, that doesn't have anything to do with whether we actually are imperial and whether we actually do exploit people around the world. Right, because right. Cap capitalism doesn't make its decisions moving forward based on the most efficient thing. That's, as that's the thing I'm trying to like keep hammer, hammer home yeah. about. Like, the ideological component of what moves capitalism isn't necessarily the thing that's emancipatory, right? Right, right, yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Like, um, and this is where also, you know, like, 
in the online thing, I'm trying to t tell people like, look, guys, like, 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 like when we're talking about like capitalism, for one, you're talking about a political economic system. That's why we call it political economy, right? <laughs> yeah. So when folks discuss this kind of like emancipatory potential of capitalism, they're talking about a very particular form of liberalism, of liberal capitalism, right? right? Um, we can see in China, authoritarian capitalism can do very, very well, right? And China has been pretty good at even on some like basic stuff in terms of trying to like move people out of poverty and all these other key and on some other essential development metrics, right? So in that case, you know, capitalism is not an emancipatory project, right? And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, like the ability to, to be able to like buy another's labor power, you know, in some like semblance of a market and then to like try and produce goods in a rather efficient fashion doesn't necessarily require a whole lot of freedoms. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You know, um, and while free labor works best and these kinds of abilities for, for people to more, to, the ability for, for like the ability for people to more or less move freely about like, while those are like probably necessary components, right? Capitalism has been like interspersed with unfree labor since forever, yeah. right? Um, so when people talk about the like emancipatory potential of these things, right? Like it can't just be this kind of like, oh, if you bring markets here, then there's like magic, right? Like that there's an entire set of like political and institutional questions, right? And there are like multiple competing factions and ideologies as you've pointed out even within those folks who are like okay with capitalism about like how do we make this thing go right so um and you know like um so if you look at the chinese right like the chinese if all you care about is capitalism as like a system in terms of like i want to be able to like produce goods wherever china is an overwhelming success right if you're someone who tries to link capitalism along with the kind of like greater individual political freedoms as embodied in liberalism, then the Chinese example should be a major, major blow to your conception of the emancipatory potential of capitalism itself, right? right. But that kind of like self-reflection never comes up. <laughs> yeah. That's just despite the fact that the 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 free free trade policies opening up uh, uh, markets to China was was sold as as if markets would automatically kind of dissolve the Communist Party and uh, China would become more and more liberal over time. When in fact the opposite has happened. It's probably more authoritarian now than it's been, you know, since uh, since like Maoist days. Right. And the frustrating thing about it is that you know, especially like for folks who push it in the U.S. We could simply look at our own experience, right? Like, <laughs> hell, uh, the heyday of Detroit of, like, the 40s through, like, the early 1950s or the 30s through, like, the early 1950s, it, like, all the labor there was heavily segregated, super heavily segregated, right? Yeah. I mean, so, again, right now, um, they weren't using enslaved folks, but this kind of just, like, rank racism that said blacks work these jobs, they don't work these other jobs, right? Like you have these hard, like internal racial labor markets or racist labor markets, right? And they had buku growth in consumption. Why? Because the people who were hurt are a small racialized minority, right? And as long as you have like the majority of these white folks are able to enjoy the benefits of this like greater production and growth, you know, then keeping this like smaller group of people, you know, in abject poverty, basically, doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. And that's always been the kind of like trick there. And that's also how we continue to hide the continual plunder. Right. I mean, um, I think another kind of like fascinating contemporary example is the continued theft of black farmers land. Right. Oh, and like, yeah. You know, and I mean, like, it doesn't get more like classical enclosure bullshit than literally going in and kicking a person off of their land and then like reselling it to some like big time, um, 
Monsanto type beast, you know, um, that is a direct theft of black wealth and black potential productive capacity. Right. And then there's even the like secondary grossness of like, Hey man, this is a farm producing food. <laughs> right? right. So, right, right, yeah. right. I mean, so plunder continues, right? Well, and, and that's, yeah, yeah. And it's not even, so even look, there's this new book out, the Dying, Dying of whiteness, right? Like it's, and this is, this is a classic thing within capitalism where, um, you know, the othering of marginalized groups uh, serves to, to help the interests of, of the elite and, and the wealthy as against even the white people who are in the lower classes. And this is like Calhoun, you know, Corey Robin talks about how Calhoun appropriated the, the use ideologically of equality and said, you know, uh, poor white people don't worry about the fact that the aristocratic plantation owners have more wealth than you because we're equally white and we're equally superior, right? And right. so th this is a, a common ideological uh, way that the powerful pit people with less against each other and stoke racial division. Right. Oh, yeah. No, no you're right. I mean, like, you know, and that is why, you know, I'm like, I'm trying to use the term racial capitalism more uh, as a way to like try and clarify or sharpen that point. Um, as, as people are trying to, you know, the ideological project, at least for, for many like American conservatives or neoliberals on the question of racism is to hive off capitalism, you know, from the pollution of racism, right? Yeah. But you cannot do it, right? Because capitalism right. does not exist outside of people. It does not exist outside of these institutions. And if you can show that these institutions in particular are rife with all kinds of like racist assumptions and practices, yeah. you know, then it's not an irresponsible leap to say, oh, then this capitalism also operates in a racist fashion. And we see this. We see this in many different kinds of ways, right? Like... Um, so if we take a look at like, um, the question of housing again, it comes up, right? There are these like, kind of like classic hedonic studies where it says like, oh, a house in a black neighborhood, right? Assuming like all the other features are the same as like a house in a white neighborhood, you know, the white house is going to be worth more, right? So there is yep. a premium given to whiteness, Right. Or there's a penalty, if you will, given to blackness, right? That is not a rational, in terms of like your pricing mechanism, that's right. not a rational thing to understand, right? Yeah. But if race, or more specifically racism, is baked into the pricing mechanism, yep. then that's how it's going to work out, right? So the pricing mechanism is not independent of racism. Racism is endogenous to the price, to borrow yes. the terminology of the economist, right? And when mm. you take that into account, that kind of like Becker argument around the like relative lack of efficiency of discrimination becomes farcical, right? Because it's like, um, um, because the like individual features of a like black worker or potential black agent versus a white agent are penalized, right? And if that's the case, then it would still be rational in a strict sense for, say, like a hiring manager to prefer a white person with a high school diploma over a black person with a college degree for a job that would probably require some form of like additional technical expertise that a person with a college degree would probably more likely have than someone who does not have one. Yeah, that's a great point. And that and that was what jumped out at me reading that Milton Friedman thing was that he assumes that markets are so perfectly inefficient, or, sorry, perfectly efficient that, you know, equal people will be treated equally. But if you just actually look at what happens, it doesn't, you know, all this stuff is baked in from the start. And so there is no possibility of people making the trade that they would, you know, propose to like hire all the quote unquote underpriced black laborers or whatever to make gangbusters profits. It's just not possible because, you know, of all the stuff you mentioned. That's a great that's a great way of putting it. But I will say one thing that 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 does seem like the one unequivocal way in which uh capitalism could enable this sort of this like a an emancipatory project is 
if we if we accept the idea that a slave society is going to be less productive, um, and, you know, less efficient, and so on, then um, if there is a war between uh, a, a, a sort of slave based capitalism and a free labor based capitalism, um, and they are otherwise equally matched, as as we were saying before. The, the free labor capitalism is going to win. And that's exactly what happened in the civil war. Right. And so this, you know, insofar as like that extremely contingent event happens, you know, where you have like a sort of the, the, uh, you know, competitive, um, uh, re reforming of institutions or just one country conquering the other one, um, then, then you could see this, you know, a, a, a institution like slavery being extirpated. But boy, outside of that context, it's just really not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly, exactly, exactly. But like, it's it's hard, right? So, look, I mean, I think that you could make strong efficiency claims against slavery as a preferred mode of production. Yeah, yeah. you you can do that. I personally think you can make a stronger normative claim. Saying that <laughs> slavery is just bad and move on with it. <laughs> that's right. That's another great point. No, that's another great point. Like the 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 eschewing of normative claims with something like slavery for of all things, right? The desire to focus on empirics and like you know efficiency talk is so symptomatic of the problem. With uh, I mean, I think neoliberalism, frankly, is just uh, uh just if we can only relegate the market to be the arbiter of morality or, and, and, or pretend morality doesn't exist and hope that that's enough. It's just like so frustrating. I mean, Ryan, you even wrote about how even from just an economic development perspective uh, over, I think, was it the last 30 years, there's like a couple trillion dollars left on the table. Uh, if you had just like grown the economy at like an, a standard rate per like, uh, the normal stock uh, mutual fund growth or something like that. Like, like capitalism has crisis all the time in a way that we might deem irrational because it's not really about what it says it's about. And in fact, it is the last kind of system to be in charge of our morality or norms. Yeah, yeah. That No, I'm referencing a paper by J.W. Mason, and and he he looks at you know you just do a real simple calculation of per capita GDP growth adjusted for inflation from 1945 to 2007 it's going up from by about 2.2 uh, percent a year then after the financial crisis like there's a big collapse and then the rate of growth growth slows down by about 40 percent it's down to like 1.5 percent or something. Um, and so the gap of that as of 2017 was something like $3 trillion, which is more than the GDP of California. Um, and <clears throat> that the total sum, you know, the integral over that period from 2007 to what you might consider uh, is the potential, which is just following the pre-2007 trend, uh, is something like $15 trillion. So nearly an entire year's worth of output just flushed down the toilet. And yeah, I think Alexi, as you say, there, there's, you know, you can speak about these counterfactuals. Like I saw Iglesias saying that, you know, oh, if Russia hadn't had serfdom, it would have been 40 percent richer by 1914 or something like that. But like, unless you have very specific institutions and, uh, you know, geopolitical like situations to make that happen, uh, it doesn't happen. Like there is no like there is no god of markets to sort of pry out these things and replace them with what would be maybe possibly in an alternative uh, dimension a better way of doing stuff because you know it's all contingent and i think yeah as you know as you're saying markets are, are are embedded in society and if society has all of these appalling features about it the market will just happily adapt to that you know M mafia money spends just as good as regular money no, that's true I, but that's true and also too i think and this is where like you know you can probably catch i think um i think you can catch madden a little bit of a contradiction with himself is that you know like such claims i believe they are interesting from a technical standpoint, but also, you know, clearly it's used 
as a way to talk about contemporary policy issues. And that's basically saying, hey, guys, like serfdom isn't good. We should like, you know, continue to try to like expand a certain way of like, you know, certain modes of production. Right. Um, You know, so in that case, he's like, you know, you know, so in that case, he's using the economic history argument again, right, to talk about the historical, but also the contemporary superiority of the, you know, of certain modes and ways of production. But also at the same time, you know, like he had this weird tweet uh, where he was basically like, you know, all the like new historians of capitalism folks think that these economic historians are disagreeing with them because of an ideological difference. And he was like, that's clearly not the case. Um, And basically like, um, he said something to uh, he said something to the effect that like things that happened like a couple of years ago like don't influence like policy and politics today, um, <laughs> and I like like my eyes like bugged out of my head. <laughs> and for that example, he basically said, "Look, guys, we all agree that like the foundation of the U.S. was based upon the like plunder." of the indigenous people that are here, but that doesn't impact policy today. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, like what? We literally have a Bureau of Indian Affairs, bruh. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, 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 yeah. like, 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 what the hell are you talking about? So, uh, right. So I work in child welfare now, and I also reside in the state of Oregon that has a large indigenous population, right? Um, I got an email just this past week talking about the recent ruling on ICWA or um, um, the Indian Child uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act that uh, that was passed in 1978 because the U.S. government, you know, has a long history of kidnapping Native kids, right? Yeah. You know, like, you know, um, um, they have a terrible, terrible time of it. And this Bush appointee basically tried to, like, kill it by saying that because the law was based upon a particular like racial classification that um, that was unconstitutional. Uh, now for my work specifically, my office has an office of tribal affairs because Oregon has a lot of folks who, who live on the res. And we also, I believe have the highest proportion of urban Indians, I think in the country, um, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, but part of the team that I'm working with, a project that uh, a project that they started on before I got there, was looking at like uh, rates of different children who get taken away from their parents, right? And indigenous kids and black kids were taken at like much higher rates, even accounting for the like different like risk levels or like family features that they had, right? And it was my team's job to basically go uh, t- to go and try and estimate like what does that look like and try to devise some ways to basically like fix that, right? So these things exist today, like quite literally this year. The state of Oregon is like, hey, uh, we're taking way too many native kids, and it doesn't seem like we're taking them because they're actually in bad like families. We need to do something about that, right? And I'm super happy and proud to be part of a team that is working to try and redress that. But also, we shouldn't have been there in the first damn place, right? Mm -hmm. So so that kind of, like, weird claim from Iggy, like, it just, like, boggled my mind where I'm like, what do you think the role of, like, historical study is? in some of these statements, right? Or how do you even like go to understand like politics or policy to say that a thing that happened, you know, like 200 years ago clearly has no influence on what is going on today. Like, I, like, I, I don't understand how you conceive of different institutions or practices or even like peoples, right? Like basically mm. like, like, you know, black politics, right? Like black people exist in the U S or mm. even throughout the diaspora, right? Like black people exist in the Western diaspora because of slavery and colonialism, right? And there's like a whole set of politics that has arisen from that, right? And you can like trace that quite clearly, right? Like my family 
would not have come out of Tennessee and North Carolina if it weren't for all that damn slavery. So, like, yeah. how can we discuss saying, like, oh, these things that happened, like, 200 years ago clearly have no impact on the politics of the day. Like, it's just, it's such a, like, like, it's a weirdly, it's not even, like, a conservative argument. It's just a, like, no. weird, like... Stupid. <laughs> well, no, yeah, but yeah. a historical, it's, 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 I mean, I imagine it's the wonk dream of taking yourself out of time and place and history and just running some data and being able to spit out, you know, and if only you could have a technocracy where everyone listens to you based on your, your, your data analysis, you could ignore all moral quandaries and harms that would otherwise be produced. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it I mean, is it's just such a weird take like it was, it was such a yeah. weird take i was like i don't know where this is coming from is it not the case i mean you know you look at um you know po uh political results maps like go go and dig up 2016 results county by county and you can see where do you get democratic votes in rural areas and one place you can see is native american reservations the navajos out there in new mexico and the you know the Utes in in uh, in, in parts of Colorado, um, in Arizona, um, and then there's you know the black belt right, and that is fairly contiguous with a certain type of soil, if I'm not mistaken, which is like very good for growing cotton, right? And so like you can see stuff that you know like decisions that were established like 400 years ago, establishing you know, and determining who wins particular counties today, right? Mm. Like, oh, yeah. An enormous legacy. I mean, that's the single most important part of how the United States uh, behaves today, why Trump is president, why the United States does not have a proper welfare system like every other peer nation, you know, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly right. And then that comes back full circle to the debate or debate such that it is, right? And it's like, you know, how do you want to conceive of like, quote unquote, the economy or capitalism or something like that? And um, and that's where, again, I would say that, that, you know, at least in the context of the Twitter wars, I do think there's a legit like epistemological difference and folks are kind of like speaking past each other. But in terms of the kind of like greater like cultural battle that is being waged between the New York Times, the National Review and Breitbart, like, and all this other kind of stuff, right? Like it absolutely matters in terms of that way, right? Um, how, how should we understand our response to it then in terms of uh, lessons to be learned politically, like wh whether, it, basically how does proper theory inform proper political praxis? Because I, I right. mean, I think, Political struggle is the reason that the, the oppression and domination was kind of uh, stemmed by, right? Like civil rights right. and various victories didn't just arise from emancipatory capitalism at, at, at the hand right. of the invisible hand, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, no, right. I, I, it, so I mean, today, look, like, what's the, what's, what does that look like today, maybe? Um, I mean, I think we're seeing bits and pieces of it in many different avenues, right? I mean, like, I had immense hopes for Black Lives Matter. Um, and while there have been some like, like while there has been some movement and some success, um, it like, it doesn't look like the kind of like necessary organizing that should, um, that should have been done to make it a more national movement was necessarily done in a good fashion. Now, I do think that there's like a lot of like really vibrant movement that's still going on in different cities across the country um, that is directly due to the like eruption and uprisings, right, um, from Black Lives Matter. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of Black Lives Matter helping to seed a kind of like new civil rights movement or new set of claims around the rights of individuals, in particular, talking about their relation to the police uh, and the carceral state, right? Like that hasn't mm -hmm. necessarily arisen, I think, in a wider fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I do think that that, you know, that's not necessarily the fault of hardworking activists, right? But I would like, I, I did hope that more 
would pop out of that. Maybe it's like like a final question. Do do you see any any sort of broad potential for maybe say like your sort of Black Lives Matter um, type that sort of school of organizing folding in with uh, you know a sort of President Bernie President Warren t- uh, uh, movement. You know, we we did an episode on on uh, uh, Bernie and Warren's like criminal justice platform, both like a total like utter break from from the last. Uh, you know, 40 years of Democratic Party politics. Um, and and yet, like, neither of them have really made that. Like, I feel like their campaigns have really internalized the thinking of Black Lives Matter. Um, and at the same time, they're trying to run. They're, they're, like, I think kind of Bernie especially, but but Warren in her, like, kind of slightly technocratic way, they're trying to create a multiracial coalition, which of necessity includes sort of, you know, lower class to, you know, just ideologically committed uh, uh, upper class and middle class white people, you know, to say that, like, this sla- this this legacy of slavery shit is strangling us, you know, it's like, like it's it's fucking us up. Look at our life expectancy and where is life expectancy falling the most like like low class whites um, fallen three years in a row, you know, di- like opioid overdoses, like heavily, no, not exclusively, but heavily concentrated in white communities and so on. Like, but on the other hand, you know, you see the sort of Trumpy, uh, you know, people that I know personally, uh, lower class white people who are just like, yeah, you know, like just death drive shit, you know, like wh- wh- <laughs> all in, like, I don't, I don't care if I die of, you know, uh, um, keto acidosis or whatever like i'm all i'm all in on trump um i don't know what what do you think i mean on the like bernie and warren thing like you know they're they're not going to win an election by walking into most states and saying hey guys we're locking up too many black people right like (laughs) you know that like i think um i I think that that is an empirically and normatively like true statement. Um, it is not a winning argument in national politics, right? I do think that they can continue to advocate for like sensible reform on all of these kinds of questions, and they can pull that like straight from the Black Lives Matter platform, right? And yeah. while I would hope that they would say, "Hey, look, the Black Lives Matter folks from like these cities and whatnot were the inspiration for this," I entirely understand. If, you know, they just kind of, like, put that down there and then just kind of, like, leave it as it is um, and see what's good, right? Um, That's kind of been how you have to play it. Um, And that's how you have to play it in a racist-ass country where, again, (laughs) right, like, you know, um, where, again, right, like, if people think that, you know, if black people are going to get over, right, then, like, that is a really, like, like, big way to not have someone support your policy, right? Um, so if you can go to like, um, so if you can go to like a central Oregon or a Southern Oregon, right? Where people don't necessarily like the cops, right? Yeah. And if you can be able to say, hey man, um, you know, we want to make it harder for cops to just go in and like hassle you or go and arrest your son and abuse them in the local jail and not a resource and all this other kind of stuff. Right. Uh, people will listen to that. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, they may not listen to it. If you say, Hey, these black people in Portland uh, gave us this idea, right? Because those folks hate Portland and they certainly do not like black people, especially yeah. black Portlanders. Right. So it's like, they're, they're not necessarily in a win, win place there. So I don't necessarily begrudge them that fact. Um, I do, I would like to see that if one is to win, and I, God, I hope one of them does win, um, that, that they actually do move forward with it and push. Because the last thing I want is to have another, like, you know, another Obama moment where you're like, oh, man, he's talking about he wants to do this, 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 and this. And then you're like, oh, you're really not going to do a goddamn thing to actually <laughs> try and, like, like, to try and help these folks in a like real intent and serious way. Right. I don't mean to entirely throw away the Obama years 
you know, I think the ACA for what it is was like, you know, a major achievement. Also, it probably won't last a decade, right? So for the kind of like massive structural change thing that they were going to talk about, you know, that like they put in so many weak spots and loopholes in order to like assuage these Republicans, you know, that they basically like doomed it from the start. Um, it's just, it's just like so wild and disappointing. Um, so I do hope that, you know, even if they don't shout out the Black Lives Matter folks, that they take those policies seriously and push for them very, very hard. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. You know, you, you look at who gets hassled worse by the cops um, and you sort of break it down by education and race. Number one, by a gigantic margin, is black people without a college degree or sorry, without a high school degree. Right. I mean, you're talking about like a 65 percent lifetime chance of incarceration. But number two, depending on which which uh, study you look at, are white people without a without a high school education down by like more than half, I think. But still, a, by by absolute terms, a huge number of people. And so, you know, one would think that, it, you know, if if you had that, you know, some rhetorical sense and yet it internalized that logic, in addition to a sort of broad uh, sort of economic egalitarianism, you could say, hey, look, you know, I'm we're we're just we just want like these jails are out of control folks there's too many people dying in there like let's let's just let's look at this sensibly and you know worth trying i suppose another way to think of that is that if capitalism we can say sometimes is liberatory sometimes it, it really is cruel and exploitative and often it involves like taking advantage of and stoking racial division Properly understood, socialism is definitely egalitarian and supporting of the liberation and emancipation of all people who are under the thumb of the state and capital and, and the abuses of that power. And so, like, whether, you know, what routes rhetorically to get people to wake up to the fact that they can overthrow these oppressive ways of, of domination, um, you know, that's a strategic question, I guess. But, like, fundamentally, if you keep speaking truth to power in a way that resonates universally, hopefully we can build that solidarity across races and across um, all kinds of people who would be more free and less harmed uh, by yeah. the way that we live now. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. You know, you know, and, and again, right. And I don't want to like understate the fact that look, like we have had um, some interesting victories. Right? I think you know the whole kind of like minimum wage wave was a fascinating thing. And that was, you know, a whole lot of like, like cross racial union organizing in particular from the SEIU and, and some other kinds of groups. Right. Um, and I don't think people really expected that to be the case. Uh, I don't want to understate that success, even as I recognize that the SEIU has also done a poor job of actually, you know, like, trying to expand the number of people who exist underneath a union. <laughs> um, but at the same time, there are, are a whole lot of people who are making more money now precisely because of the changes in the minimum wage law than they had before. Right. And I think that we can also see a similar thing with the wave of teacher strikes. Right. And there's still a whole lot of like teacher militancy that is going on in these red states that have like mm, no idea. Right about like yeah. what to do with it, right? So like there is a like growing constituency of folks who are like solidly like a middle-class educated group, right? Uh, but the thing is though, is that, you know, like, like, you know, they are public servants, right? And they are, and they're like the losers of the public, right? Because, uh, because as much as folks want to talk about how they love schools and they care about schools, right? Like school funding is like, like a fundamentally like broken thing. Schools are required to basically be the safety net. Right. And yeah. yeah. Right. You know, like, um, so like, you know, schools are like structurally placed in these like impossible decisions. And then to add the insult to injury, you want to tell people, well, you know, I don't understand why you want to make more than $30,000 a year and have health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, like it's, it's the most like insulting thing ever. And like, I'm just very curious as to what were the things that helped to precipitate 
this newest wave. And I know that there have been a couple of books out on it. I haven't read them yet, but I am very, very curious. And I would love to see that continue to expand and move forward. Um, so I do think we have some areas where I think we've seen some success and there's like ongoing movement and organizing, right? And I think at least as an academic, you know, part of my role, if I were like a labor person is to study what are those people doing there, right? And is it possible to like scale up or move that model to a different kind of place? Yeah, that's great advice. But um, I've got to take off. Uh, but Jamal, Dr. Dr. Jamal Green, <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Everybody follow him at Surly Urbanist. Clog up his mentions with obnoxious questions. And um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see you. Hopefully, we'll see you again sometime. Thank yeah, you so much for coming on. Dude, pleasure. thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. I'll talk to you later. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Last but not least, we have a friendly reminder that we have a Patreon. You can support the show with $5 a month and get an extra episode every week. Uh, we really appreciate the support, and it helps us keep this going.